3,500 New Zealanders were on operations in Vietnam between 1964 and 1972, this country's most sustained and most controversial war effort of the 20th century. Kiwis were in the air, in offices and operating theatres, in the hospital wards, tunnels and jungles of Vietnam during the near decade of New Zealand's allegiance with the US-led coalition. They served closely with Australian forces, fighting the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. Nursing sister Daphne Shaw, rifleman Bruce Knight and helicopter pilot Brian Sen are among those who came home. 37 of their brothers and sisters in arms did not. I'm very glad I went to Vietnam because I think I did something. The reason I went was to look after the New Zealand troops. And I felt, feel I did a good job and that they appreciated what we did. And you know, see that when you go to the reunions and things now, the girls are always looked after. So it continues, you know, 40 years on. We were just probably relieved we got to come back unscathed. Um, we never used to talk about the guys that died, got killed over there. Um, not that we ever forgot them, but it was sort of a taboo. It hasn't been until you know, sort of 20, 30 years later they actually talked about them. I think my time in Vietnam made me <coughs> also made me a lot wiser and a lot more secure, or well, the army made me a lot more secure within myself. In Vietnam, I served at the One Ostfield Hospital at Vung Tau, which was the hospital that treated those Australian and New Zealand soldiers that were injured or got ill in Vietnam. My job was mainly as a, as a ward sister, working in the wards or in ICU for the post-surgery patients. When I arrived in Vietnam, it was a bit of a shock to the system because I arrived in the Bristol freighter, got offloaded out onto the tarmac, and that was it. I was just left there, and I, nobody knew because they didn't. The, the Bristol freighter just stopped, dropped me, and took off. And I was left there all on my little lonesome until some kind soul picked me up in a jeep and took me over to the hospitals. When I was standing there on my own, I sort of thought, why am I here? What, what have I done to deserve to be just left here? And there was lots of planes flying around and choppers and things, and I thought, oh dear, I hope nobody drops any bombs here or anything. I think the reason was because the Bristol freighter, freighter was a bit late getting there, or nearly a day late, and I think they'd sort of forgotten that Oh dear, there should be another New Zealand nurse coming up. So it was just a, an administrative error somewhere. Yeah, that's me. I think it's probably the only time I'm not behind the camera. Obviously, I'd lost a bit because I've got four beers in my hand. Oh, my, my old movie camera, that did all the movies. It's, it's a damn good one, or was it? Best, of the, best you could buy at the time. Got it from the American PX for $157. MPC. Haven't had it in a box for years. And out of that long closed Pandora's box, along with the camera and old film reels, come a rush of memories. After nearly 40 years, there's finally a soundtrack for Bruce Knight's home movies of the Vietnam War. Nicknamed Sniper, Knight was well known for his singular vision and crack aim, both down the barrel of a gun and through the viewfinders of the cameras he carried in his kit. A country boy turned soldier at 19, Knight's hours of silent footage were shot in the early 1970s, in Singapore en route to and from Vietnam, and during his year-long tour of duty with Victor V Infantry Company. 
they give a taste of life in New Zealand and Australian bases, telling a story common to thousands of Kiwi infantrymen based in Nui Dat, South Vietnam, of downtime behind barbed wire. Well, I was a little, I found the conditions okay. I was a little bit older than a lot of the ones. I was 27 when I went to Vietnam. So I'd done a bit, I'd been around the world a bit and I knew, you know, I knew I wasn't going to the uh, Royal Albert Hall. I was going to a war zone. So the, the accommodation was acceptable. It was fairly basic, but uh, you had a bed and you had a fan and you had a window. The shower block there, they, that was okay, that was okay. you know, there was just a, a, you just had a canvas bag with a shower rose on it. <clears throat> when we got there we had no hot water, but one of the guys was an electrician, and uh, he soon had the water sorted out. I don't know how he got it, got the, got the electricity to it, but he was a clever guy. So we were the probably luckiest platoon of the lot, because we had hot water. Um, the latrines were a different story, they were horrible things. They were just one big pit with a wall around it, much the same height as that, much the same size as that, with one bed, bench, big bench seat with only six to eight holes in it, and that's what you sat on. But the stench was shocking. We reckoned that it wasn't, the mesh didn't keep the flies out, it kept the flies in, because it was just shocking. You never open your mouth and breathe in that in the latrines because you breathe a fly in. You'll see the corrugated iron that was blast walls. They were about five foot high so when you slept you were down um, below the wall by about two feet. So at the end of the day, it, the base was attacked, only a direct hit will take a tent out and its occupants. We got pretty good food, really. You know, Mr Washer used to send us up boxes of tinned fruit and stuff. Um, one time he sent a whole herc load of tinned sweet corn. I was sick of eating sweet corn, but never mind, because the Vietnamese didn't like it very much. But we always, the girls always loved um, Kazavak Day, when the tr plane came up from Penang, and the girl, the Australian air crew girls, used to bring us fresh bread and sausage rolls. And so that was very much appreciated. But as I said, I think before, we used to go around to the restaurants quite often and there was very much a French influence still on the cooking. So they had some beautiful food. They had one Chinese restaurant there, or Vietnamese, who used to make the most beautiful chicken and sweet corn soup. But you had to take your own container. We didn't have a lot of containers, but what we did have was these urine collection bags with a string, pull string top. So we used to go in and get two litres of... <laughs> Chicken and mushroom, I mean, chicken and sweet corn soup in our urine bag. You know, we used to go down there, and that's if you had an eyes your mate, well, you'd go down there and you'd meet up down there. And the barber shop, you know, he's, he used to give you a shave, haircut, shave with a cutthroat razor, but it kind of um, got closed down because the barber was, uh, he must have got a lot of intelligence out of that place because he was uh, killed on a patrol, what's called a tail patrol, tactical air responsibility patrol, uh, not that far from the base, so he was a communist. Our relationships with the servicemen were, were pretty good really, they treated the girls very well. Um, we used to have a New Zealand, not it wasn't a club, but about once a month when the boys were down on leave, we would go into town to the, the Grand Hotel and have a meal, so we kept the New Zealand context together. Um, but all the other troops, the, the Australians, the Americans and things, were always very respectful of the girls. As far as recreation, there wasn't very much. You worked in the day and partied at night. And unfortunately that's what, that's what happened because you couldn't really go very far because the, the girls were outnumbered about 20 to 1 at any party. So you always danced and looked after for drinks and Yes, very protected. Now, if you read your history about war, 75% of all soldiers that go to hospitals go because they're sick. 
not because they've been shot or anything, because if you get shot, you die. And it was one of the hardest things I ever had to try and teach so young soldiers, young medic soldiers, that in fact you're going to be looking after coughs, colds, sprained ankles, malaria, those sorts of things. You're not going to see a lot of people that have got sucking chest wounds and minus their legs and things because they just don't don't live. Because we knew or knew of most of the troops, whenever we heard that there was a New Zealand dust off, of course there was the anxiety of, you know, who is it? Is it somebody I know very well or or not? Because so when, when the boy Winton was killed, um, he saw his brother came because they were serving together, which was quite unusual. And uh, I was one of the ones that sort of said to John, I'm sorry, your brother's dead. So it was very, very personal. We used to write letters home for them and this sort of thing, so we knew a lot of personal details about them. You know, writing home after a guy had got a Dear John letter or something. They sort of opened their hearts to you, but they felt they could because you were, in, because you were a New Zealander. Yeah. And that, that was a very privileged communications that you had with some of the troops. We had mainly Australian and New Zealand servicemen, but we also treated uh, Arvin troops, that was the, the uh, South Vietnamese troops, and from time to time we had POWs as well. We used to look after some of the uh, Vietnamese civilian injured occasionally, like if a little child got run over, we had a little boy we called Pooh Bear. He got run over by an Australian truck and he ended up, we had to amputate one leg. So we looked after him for some months after, after he'd been injured. And when his mum and dad came to collect him, he didn't want to go with them, he wanted to stay with us. I thought, well, we must have given him reasonable care. But we used to take him swimming and all sorts of things. And he was a delightful little child. Intelligence wanted prisoners. They wanted to get some information. Um, preferably on D-445, which was the North Vietnamese regiment that we had uh, fought with. We had started to move up into the Nui Taiwais, or the Wolvertons, as the Americans called it, for the other song, Don't Go on Wolverton Mountain, because um, you'll get killed sort of thing. <laughs> um, and they, they nicknamed them the Wolvertons. The Americans had been out there about four or five years previous and lost about 120 men, and they never went back. And uh, you know, we were heading up this track and it was well used. We started to move up the more steeper area of the, the hill. The track was on a virtually, it was a show of rock each side and you just walked across it, the top of a ridge. You know, it was only probably that, that wide. You know, not really wide, probably a metre wide if I recall in some parts. Um, and up in front of us there was a, an outcrop of rock where the track went into it and wound through, sort of in an S. <clears throat> but what we'd noticed on the way up was um, what it looked like. To us, we just ignored them. Um, what it looked like um, artillery shells being buried in the ground because there was wire sticking up out of the ground. But uh, I guess other people saw it but didn't say anything. But I saw it and I thought, oh, you know, something wrong here, but hey, no one else has seen it. They must have seen them. And these, what we saw on the ground, were mines. But they'd done, they'd set the mines, the Claymore mines, as far as the rock outcrop. And these mines probably went for 100 yards at least. Uh, Rooker lost both legs. Doc Taku lost one leg. Porky Charles got shrapnel through his gut, took out his spleen and other bits and pieces. That's the one, two, three. Alan Kerr, at the time, didn't know he was wounded. Ross, got superficial wounds. And the others were from the ensuing, um, it wasn't the fight at all, they were throwing grenades down us all the time and with the rock shale, they would get splinters and some of the guys, some of the guys got hurt and never, even if you got a small splinter in yourself, you always move back there. 
um, we called in artillery. We were pinned down for 10 hours. We virtually called in artillery on our own position to cover ourselves when we got back. We were only probably 40, 40 metres in front of us. And this was after we had medevaced everybody. But before the medevac went out, the helicopter came in. Alan Kerr collapsed just in front of me. He had um, shrapnel on the base of his neck. Um, he was the last, we had to call another helicopter in to get him out. I can remember his screams as he was lifted off on the jungle penetrator. We had a big, a big ambush came in and we, you do a reverse triage in war. So you treat the least injured first and the ones that are really badly injured, they sort of hang around till the end and then you give it a go if there's something. Mind you, that's the way surgery develops. War advances surgery more than anything else in the world because they'll give it a go. And there was one Australian lad, a young corporal, who had been hit by a claymore and so he had, he'd lost one leg, one arm, one eye and a whole lot of abdominal wounds. But he did live and we did send him home to his parents and. I've had I had contact with them for some years afterwards, and, and in fact until he died. Some of the helicopter pilots were bloody heroes as far as we're concerned, like getting medevacs out. Um, when um, we got hit on the Nuuto base, they could have quite easily been shot down. Helicopter pilot Brian Sen doesn't think himself a hero for his Vietnam War service. He was just following orders, doing what he was trained for. He loved the thrill of flying Iroquois helicopters, the challenge of extracting New Zealand and Australian Special Air Service troopers from dense jungle while under enemy fire. The, the first one here, there's a bit of, just a wisp of red smoke coming out of the jungle. And that would have been the, the SAS patrol would have popped a, a smoke can and it would have seeped up. So already 01 would have been in radio contact with them and, and asked them to pop the smoke and it identified so we knew we were going to the right place. Right. And it was the right guys on the ground. Because later on it, it got to the point where not so much the smoke but at night with the, with the um, dust offs, you asked them to pop a strobe and several strobes had come up. So the, the enemy were on the radio frequencies. And they'd, they'd say, you don't know where you're going, so you just have to go home. To confuse you. Yeah. So then you, at that stage you just have to abandon it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why you'd call, you know, they had different coloured smokes. Yeah. And they'd pop a smoke and you'd say, I see a red smoke or I see a blue smoke. Because if another smoke turned up, it could be, well, it could be the wrong one. You know? mm -hmm. So that was the first thing, to get to the right place. So you come into the hover and um, whilst you're coming in, again, all pretty understood by the communications between Zero One and the guys on the ground, that there'd be the enemy were southwest of us here or whatever, whatever. So the gunships would be coming in and doing their gunnery and, and firing rockets into the area to suppress anything that might be coming from that area. And so you'd be sitting there and you might even have your own guns on the left-hand side of the aircraft firing into the jungle, maybe. Um, so you come into, so there's the, you can see the gunship doing this pass, firing pass, just pulling out of it there. Well, this one, and this photograph was taken from 03 sitting back, so there's 02 actually doing the extraction. Then the next one I've got, 02 is sitting there winching, and you can see the wire, the winch wire coming down, and down here you can see some SAS guys on the wire being pulled in. There's only two of them. So it's quite a long winch actually when you look at it. So there's still, at this stage, it's quite likely maybe still somebody on the ground. That always, the last one, two people to come together, you'd never leave one guy on the ground by himself. And they'd be perhaps firing into the jungle, I'm not too sure, the, depending on the circumstances. So you winch them up. And then here, this one was taken actually in the aircraft. And you can see the, the crew and gunner who operated the winch. So he's moved out of his seat, he had a gun, an M60, in his pylon seat there. He's moved out of the seat to um, operate the winch. So the first SAS guy that came on board his first role was to get straight into the uh, pylon seat with the crew and gunner's gun and if need be, be firing into the jungle if whatever was appropriate. But so uh, it's a defensive thing. And then you can see the guy here, you know, sort of being dragged aboard, okay? 
and eventually the last photograph is of that same fellow we've we've obviously come out of the hover now because the crewman has swung the winch swing the winch in and this fellow here is happy he's no longer manning the gun so obviously we're, we've left the site we're flying away and there's the the other SAS guy who you can who we saw earlier being dragged on board and you can see the, the look of joy on his face and sort of relief and he's got out of it <laughs> he's still alive and helicopters have picked him up Oh, we would have been there because we were out of the place. We'd have, we'd be, we're going through our happy pills. It's a whole lot of pills you take to um, deworm you and all sorts of other things. Um, and that was just a time New Zealanders, like, you know, very hospitable people, invited some of the Aussies and across and the battalion headquarters and put on a hungry for them. So all the meat was I heard was flown over from New Zealand, so was some of the beer. Um, we put on, I think we fed about 600 all up. I could be wrong, but it was a figure I seem to have in mind. And that's the whole company together, about a week before we left Vietnam. The Vietnamese kind of gave us um, rum, and it was, well, I didn't drink at all then. Um, I took a swig of a smell of it, just about took my breath away, and I think there was a probably a dozen bottles or something for each platoon. Um, some of the guys had a swig and couldn't handle it. One guy, Mike Armstrong, reckoned he could drink half a bottle. Well, he just about had to have CPA to get him going again because it just about bowled him over. Um, it was just horrible. You know, the smell of it just put me, I can still smell it now when I think about it. Yes, I was aware of what was going on. I'd been involved in Wellington at one stage just before I left to go to Vietnam. I was down there with Pam Miley, actually, and we'd, we were in Courtney Place, and uh, there was a bit of a protest on about the Vietnam War, and neither Pam nor I are very backward at coming forward, and we sort of said a few things, and we got a bit involved <laughs> and, uh, what people thought our ancestry was. <laughs> so I was aware of what was happening. And of course we heard of what happened to the 161 battery when they came home and their march down Queen Street and the you know, throwing tomatoes and eggs and things at them. So we did know, yes. The protesters had their beliefs and I guess, you know, we live in a democratic country which allows us to protest. And I would hate to ever see New Zealand go say that we couldn't. I think some of the soldiers did take it quite personally at the the way that people were protesting. Um, particularly, you know, because all of our guys were professional soldiers. They weren't drafted like the Americans. They weren't sent over as conscientious objectors as some of the Australians were into the medical field. Um, they were very professional men and uh, I think they felt a little bit hurt that even though they were doing their duty, that they were sort of spat on and regarded as some something that came up out of the sewer. In 2006, the New Zealand government signed a memorandum of understanding with Vietnam War veterans and their families. Reconciliation for perceived injustices related to service and redress for exposure to toxins while on operations. In 2008, a trust was established to support veterans' children, the Crown formally apologised, and veterans were officially welcomed home with a parade and national reunion. Tribute 08 launched the MOU, really, and I think that it, it tried to show the soldiers that people were thinking about them and trying to do something which made what they did fair. Um, it's like everything in life, it doesn't matter how what you do, there's always going to be some that are not quite satisfied with what the outcome is, but I think it has made quite a lot of difference. It's a very slow process though, and of course we're all getting older and we don't have that much longer to on this mortal life, as they say. So everybody wants everything done very quickly, and unfortunately it hasn't happened as quickly in some cases. 
no, I think it, I think it changed me a bit. Um, well, as I said, I was a bit older, so it. I saw what happened to some of the younger girls who went up there, particularly from the Australian girls who just could not cope with the day-to-day -day existence up there. And I believe that it was because I was older. There's one thing I believe in, and that is the troops that fought in Vietnam are the last true Anzacs. Um, we were attached to the Australian regiment. We weren't part of the Americans. We weren't part of any other country with Australians and New Zealanders. Um, the modern confrontations they've been having lately, um, the skirmishes as far as I'm concerned, and the Australians and New Zealanders haven't been as close as we were in Vietnam ever again. Those two to two players represent each one of the 